Now, tonight's program will be just as impactful because our speaker has written a powerful memoir called Legacy. Many of you are holding it in your hands, and it's also going to be available for purchase thanks to Kindred Thoughts Bookstore out of Bridgeport after tonight's event. Dr. Uche Blackstock is an emergency medicine physician and founder and CEO of Advancing Health Equity. During the pandemic, she saw firsthand how structural racism magnified health disparities among black and brown people in our country. After the murder of George Floyd, Dr. Blackstock started writing this book. It's a moment when she realized her power and her truth to raise awareness about this critical issue of racism in healthcare. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Uche Blackstock to Connecticut. They bought the, brought out the comfy chairs for this conversation. <laughs> so you've been busy. Well, first, welcome again to Thank Connecticut. You. Thank you for having me. Thank you for everyone who took time out of their busy schedule to come tonight to be in community with us. When I say you've been busy, you really have been busy. So your book, Legacy, came out, I believe, January 24th. And 23rd. As 23rd. And <laughs> I stand corrected. And as Mark has mentioned, you have been interviewed multiple times on many different national media programs, podcasts, of course, Fresh Air, Marketplace, PBS, CNN, CBS. And your memoir quickly rose and became a New York Times bestseller. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So how are you feeling? Oh, I am feeling both exhausted and overwhelmed and fulfilled, and it's been a magical last few weeks. I think for me, what's been the most powerful part is that the book has resonated with so many people. Um, and the important part for me about it becoming a New York Times bestseller wasn't just that myself as a black woman author, which is also important, but that the issues that I am writing about are issues that other people seem to care about just as deeply as I do. We have a lot of people here tonight. I'm just wondering with a show of hands, how many of you work in the healthcare field? So there might be a lot in that book that yes. has resonated with the people who've raised their hands. Your book, Legacy, first of all, was hard to put down. And it is an intimate look into your journey to become a physician. And for those of you who have yet to read it, I don't want to give you too many spoilers, but you also talk about what led you to leave medicine mm -hmm. and found Advancing Health Equity. But it's also this personal story about your mother, the original Dr. Blackstock. Uh, you and your twin sister, uh, she was a graduate, your mother, from Harvard Medical School. You and your twin sister, Oni, also graduates of Harvard Medical School, so the first mother-daughter um, legacy graduates. But I'm, I'm wondering, when you think about your mother as a, an amazing woman and how she inspired you, what led you to write this book? Because, you know, there's a lot going on in the world. You're a busy person. But yes. you, you chose to peel back that curtain. Yes. Uh, well, thank you for that very thoughtful question. And it, that's an emotional question because, you know, obviously my mother, so part of it also is that my mother is no longer physically here with us. Um, she was diagnosed with acute myelogenous leukemia when my twin sister Oni and I, we were 19 years old. We were, um, you know, it was actu actually after our sophomore year at Harvard um, that she passed away at the age of 47. She's only a year, year older than I am now. Um, but writing this book, first of all, was the opportunity to give my mother a voice. Um, Legacy is a, is a love letter. If you read deeply enough into the book, it's a love letter to my mother, the original Dr. Blackstock. And she grew up in a very different set of circumstances than my sister and I did. So we, we also grew up in central Brooklyn, but you know, she was born to a single mom. 
She had five siblings, uh, grew up in public assistance, moved around a lot, didn't know when the next, next meal would be. Um, but she was very curious. She had a love of science and she found her way to Brooklyn College and became the first person in her family to graduate from college. And she had a black chemistry professor there um, who encouraged her, saw her potential and said, you need to apply to medical school. And she did. And she got into all of her medical schools and ended up matriculating at Harvard Medical School. And of course there she felt like a fish out of water because the other students in her class, some of their parents had written the textbooks that they were using. Uh, another student, uh, his uh, father had won the Nobel Prize in Immunology. Another one was a family member of Jackie Onassis. But she found her people there. And I, I want to mention that when my mom started at Harvard Med in the early 1970s, it was at the beginning of the diversity initiatives um, after MLK Jr.'s uh, assassination, um, so AKA affirmative action. And so her class was a full 10% black. But she found her folks in her class, graduated, and came back to New York City, to the neighborhood that she grew up in to practice. And so for me, that was such a powerful influence growing up. And for my sister, obviously, to see our mother, you know, having grown up with so much, you know, growing up in impoverished Brooklyn, coming back to her neighborhood to care for her family and neighbors when she could have gone anywhere after Harvard Med and doing the work of what we now call health equity with other black women physicians in our neighborhood. So I wanted to be able to give them through this book to talk about the work that we've been doing on the ground for decades, even longer than that, in our communities um, that often goes unseen. And so part of writing the book was this opportunity to talk about my mother, to talk about um, the other women that she worked with in our community, um, and really to, that, that's, I mean, that's essentially the, the legacy, one, one part of the legacy meaning of the title, this legacy of, of being a second generation black woman phys physician and the obligation I feel to continue some of the work that they had started. So the type of care that your mother and these other women physicians that you grew up with the type of care that they gave their patients were their neighbors. And it was something you talk about called culturally responsive care. So talk more about that mm -hmm. and how that can be you know, one of the ways that we can improve these disparities that we have in our country. Yes, and so, so what I'll say to that is, you know, also the book is about my own journey, and you mentioned this, from child to medical student to practicing physician, to finding my own voice. And along that way, having to unlearn and relearn certain concepts or certain gaps that were missed in my education and training. And one of the things that I think about a lot with respect to the work that my mother and her colleagues were doing is that they really were doing work that took into consideration the social context, the political context in which their patients were living, working, loving, and praying. That's what I write. You know, really thinking about what are the barriers to health? What are, what are the ways I can get to know my patient better? I always think about how, you know, often how I was taught in medical school is that, you know, this emphasis on the patient-physician dyad and that you as a physician, you have so much power and influence in that, you know, in terms of like the interventions you're prescribing or the advice that you're giving, but really what the power and influence is, is what our patients are coming into the room with. The fact that when they come into the room with us, they're coming in with their family, their friends, their employers, they're coming in with all of the, the, the systemic issues that are impacting like where they live, how they work, um, all of those things that as a physician in medical school, I didn't really, the emphasis wasn't really on that. You know, the fact is, is that most people, what influences their health, 80% of those are systemic factors. You know, 20% is actually access to healthcare, right? So I feel like as a physician and as a, as a health professional, as someone who is responsible for someone's whole being, that it is my obligation to deeply understand the life that they've 
encountered, or the life that they've had, the, the barriers that they've encountered. And this is not necessarily to say that, you know, people talk about culturally competent care, and I, I quibble with that because sometimes it, it devolves into essentially stereotypes about different groups. But I think to ask health professionals to understand what are the upstream factors like systemic racism, like the fact that we live in a capitalist society, how have practices and policies influenced how our patients live, the kind of housing they live in, employment opportunities, the quality of their education, and how does that manifest in terms of the disease and illness that we see in front of us? And so that is, I mean, those are expressions and terms that I don't even think my mom and her colleagues were using in the 80s and 90s, but they had internalized those concepts and how they cared for their patients. When we look at the stats in our country today, and you write about this, is it less than 6% of all doctors are black doctors? Less than 3% of all doctors are black women physicians. And does that make you angry? Because that was you. You were one of them, yes. but you, for many reasons, ended up leaving medicine. I know. I know. So I, I do want to say this. So I want to say that I'm so very deeply proud of my mother and everything that, um, all the, the, the just the, the work, the determination, um, you know, even though her life was cut short, um, she did so much in, in those 47 years um, as, as a mother, as a physician, as, as a partner. Um, I am also very proud to be part of the, the first black mother-daughter legacy graduates from Harvard Medical School. At the same time, I'm also very angry about that because that was in 2005 when my sister and I graduated. Since then, there's been only one other set of black mother-daughter legacy graduates. And so what I talk about in the book is this idea of exceptionalism that I wanna recognize that there were so many children in my mother's neighborhood that grew up with her that I'm sure, I'm so certain had the same potential as she did, brilliant little children that just because of poverty, because of systemic racism, um, did not end up at Harvard Medical School. So when I think about what systemic racism does um, and other systemic inequities, I think about all the people that are erased, um, the potential that's erased, the contributions that they could have made. And so in the book, I also thought it was important to talk about the Flexner Report, um, which is a report that I honestly, I didn't learn about until I was a practicing physician. And for people in the, in the audience who don't know, this is a report that was issued in 1910 by the American Medical Association and Carnegie Mellon Foundation. And they had commissioned at the time an educational specialist named Abraham Flexner to go around the United States and Canada to assess all 155 medical schools. Um, and to hold them to the criteria of essentially Western European medical schools and in the US, Johns Hopkins at the time, which was like the gold star. Um, and to look at the percentage of physician scientists on faculty, the admissions criteria, the quality of your, of your laboratory facilities. Now we know that historically black colleges and universities, there were seven at the time in, the, in, in, in 1905, that they, be, because of the legacy of slavery, they did not have large endowments. They had very small endowments. And so because of that report, five of those historically black colleges and universities were closed, those medical schools, leaving behind only Howard and Meharry. By 1905, those seven medical schools had educated about 1,500 black medical students. They had become physicians. It's estimated that if those five medical schools had not closed in 1910, they would have educated between 25 and 35,000 black physicians. 25 and 35,000 black physicians. And we can say they were black physicians because to this day, Howard and Meharry still educate the most black physicians. So HBCUs are still taking on the heaviest, heaviest burden compared to all of the other medical schools that are out there now, we are still educating the most black physicians. So I thought it was really important to talk about the Flexner Report because 
when we look at these numbers today, they are so, so dismal. And you know, Rep Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, um, a neighboring state, she talks about policy violence. The Flexner Report is an example of policy violence, of how um, a policy can have a ripple effect, you know, even um, you know, over a century later. Because if you think about all of those patients they would have cared for, all of the students and trainees they would have mentored, and all of the research, not even just in black health, but in health overall that would have happened. And so that's what we need to really understand the, the history to understand why we are where we are today, one of the reasons. So you were talking in depth about medical schools and we're talking with you just a, a day or two after this announcement went viral at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx. You probably heard a former professor donated $1 billion to enable free tuition to all students going forward. Will that make a dent? Okay, so I know people are gonna say, oh, okay, I have to have an opinion about this. And yes, I definitely think that it it's, sounds really, really wonderful. I think when these efforts happen, we have to make sure that we are intentional about how it's rolled out. So my question is, how are we going to track how the composition of the class changes socioeconomically, right? Because on the surface, I want people to understand, I'm sure people in this room understand, but there's a difference between equity and equality. So equality is treating everyone the same. So it is assuming that all of the students that are applying are coming from the same socioeconomic status, the same road traveled, and that's not the case. The fact is, is that about, I believe it's like 45% of medical school graduates come from the top quintile of, of socio socioeconomic status. So people who go to medical school are disproportionately from well-off backgrounds. So if you're, going to, if you're going to say, you can come here and get free tuition, are you giving people who already have an advantage, and it doesn't matter if it's earned or un unearned. <laughs> it's just me, it's all earned. Everything is, I mean, every, you know, it doesn't, just because of, of, of policies. But um, we need to understand, like, what is gonna be the ramification of this on on how the class looks. So another school did this, and my former colleague and good friend is, is in the audience, and she knows about this. I'm at NYU. They did something similar, and what did they find? They actually found that it made things more competitive. They actually had a higher, now have a higher GPA and higher MCAT score. They had more students of color apply, but that has not actually impacted what the class looks like. So again, intentionality, and we have to think about equity. So, you know, are people coming, you know, are they the first generation in their family to go to medical school versus, like people I went to medical school with that, I mean, I'm second generation, but people were fourth, fifth generation physicians. Like if you don't recognize that people are coming from different backgrounds, different set of resources, then you're looking at equality, not equity. I wanted to get back to when we talk about health disparities, what do we really mean? And you cite some really alarming statistics that I want to repeat here. When we look at black women who are three to four times as likely to die from pregnancy complications, no matter the socioeconomic strata or formal education. So we're talking about someone like you, Dr. Blackstock. And you talk about that in your book, that no matter what your background is, you are more likely to have complications in the delivery of your children. Can you talk about yeah. that and how you reconcile that? Right, no, I talk about it because I think a lot of times, and of course, like, never read the comment section, you know, different articles, but people say, oh no, the reason why we're seeing these inequities or these horrific outcomes is purely because of socioeconomic status, and it's not so straightforward. It's not, like, I, like in the fresh air quote, it's socioeconomic status, um, educational level of attainment profession is not as protective for black people as it is for other people in this country. And so I want to point out, you know, the, the public health researcher Arlene Geronimus, she talks about this idea this of weathering. She first described it decades ago, but this idea that living with the chronic stress of anything, it could be chronic stress of poverty, or it could be chronic stress of dealing with just everyday racism, causes a wear and tear on the body 
that prematurely ages you and makes you susceptible to developing disease and illness. And so there's that. There's also something called epigenetics, which I'm sure some people in the audience have heard about, but epigenetics is this idea that stress actually changes gene expression. So, there is, so while race itself is a social construct, the stress of dealing with racism through practice and policies, interpersonal interactions, that actually can turn genes on and off. And actually what we see is that may contribute to higher rates of diabetes, autoimmune disease, um, inflammatory diseases like atherosclerosis uh, in our communities. I mean, even when you look at uh, our telomeres, which are the ends of our the DNA, um, you can look at the ends of DNA to see um, essentially how someone has aged. And there are plenty of studies that actually show that for black people and other people of color, our telomeres are much shorter than white people of the same age, American. So this is not um, you know, race, this is the fact that living in this country is very toxic for us. And so I also quote this, um, another set of research that shows that even for black immigrants that come to this country, when they come here, their health outcomes are on par to that of white Americans. Literally after a generation of being here, their outcomes have dropped to that of black Americans. So I use those examples because often, even in how we're taught, we're, how I was taught in medical school, we're taught that there's something intrinsically wrong with black people. And there is nothing wrong with us at all. There is something very, very wrong with the social systems and institutions that we live and work within in this country. And so, like, writing this book was my one way of helping people connect the dots to why in 2024 we see these outcomes still. So even like there's another quote, there's another stat, this is, and I don't say this to shake people, but I say it because it's appalling. Um, infant mortality, so even although infant mortality rates overall have improved over the last you know, centuries, since the mid 1800s, the black-white disparity between um, black babies and white babies living to their f first year of life is more now, is more than twice now than it was 15 years before the end of slavery. And so you ask, why is that the case? Well, there was a financial interest in keeping black and slave babies alive. You know, they were property. They had financial value to them. Now they don't have any value. So these are the things that we need to really understand and understand how systems, how practices and policies make us sick. And you talk about that, you dive back into the history of why there are so few black doulas and how that has impacted uh, the infant mortality rate and the, the, um, the high rate of complications among uh, yeah. black women. Yeah, I, I mean, again, like talk about, I know there are some, people, some um, birth workers in the audience just doing some really wonderful work in our communities here, and thank you so much. Thank you. And, and, and doing it for decades, right? I know, decades unnoticed, right? Unfunded, but doing this really important work. Um, but, I talk about my own journey because I was educated you know, in the Western biomedical model. I didn't even think about for my first baby having a doula. And then I also had a very, I had a traumatic delivery. Um, and afterwards I had some um, complications that I was like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna go through that again. And so it was through my own, you know, sort of talking to my colleagues, just talking to other people um, that you know, learned about doulas. And in doing the research for my book, learning about, again, another, another example of policy violence, the Shepherd Towner Act um, in the early 1900s, which was a, a policy that essentially um, medicalized obstetrics gynecology and really erased the work of, of midwives. Um, there was a public health campaign that 
essentially advertised or promoted that the, the work of midwives was unsanitary, um, unhygienic, um, but that really what the data showed was that midwife assisted deliveries had better outcomes. But essentially what that did was, it, and it, they made it actually harder for midwives to get credentialed you know, or certified for their jobs. Um, that led to obviously fewer black midwives, it le actually led to le fewer white midwives as well, but not to as much degree. But we know one of the reasons why in this country we have you know, poor birth outcomes is because we don't have as many midwives involved as we do in other countries, middle and higher income countries. We don't have um, doulas and other birth workers as involved. And so I had to sort of relearn. I, honestly, looking back, I probably would have had two home births if I could do it again. But I remember just, you know, being at work and hearing, hearing my colleagues speak so disparagingly about home births. Yeah. So again, you know, unlearning and relearning. Like we are all on this journey. It is never too late. Um, and again, most of this happened after I finished my my formal education and training. And you were able, when you were a faculty at NYU, you saw how our healthcare system. It really is a, a system for two different realities. Can you talk a little bit about sure. that? And mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the chapters, mm -hmm. I write about the tale of two ERs because I worked, I was on faculty at, the, at this medical school where the private hospital, the public hospital are literally a block apart. Same set of faculty, but very, everything okay? Oh, sorry, 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 it's looking behind. I'm such There's a New Yorker. someone walking I'm back such a New there, I was like, what? <laughs> um, but, literally a, a just different set of resources at both hospitals, a different way even the patients were treated. Like there were ways that our patients at the public hospital were spoken to. No one would have ever spoken to them like that. They, security was called on them in very aggressive ways. Um, even the paramedics, if the paramedics brought a patient who was unhoused or intoxicated to the private hospital, the staff would give them a hard time and say, take them, take them to Bellevue. So there's so much that happens that is not formal policy, but it is an informal policy um, that happens, and our patients you know, are getting just two tiers of service. And you were treated in ways that um, left a you know, a feeling of the fact that you have been able to accomplish so much. You are, you know, you've gone to Harvard Medical School um, and you're walking into an, a room with a potential patient and they're looking at you like, who are you? Yeah, I mean, I've never been asked so much, where did you go to medical school? Like, and then where did you go to college? Um, I, I talk about in the book how there was a time when I had gone in to see this patient. I was in the room with them, and it, it's emergency medicine, so you can't, you're not in the room with them for hours. You know, you go in and out, or you may be in for about 15, 20 minutes, you go back out. But anyway, I was with this patient for enough time to get the whole story, go over what the plan was, and then my chief of service called and said, oh, the patient in room X, you know, in X is saying that they weren't seen yet by a physician. And I said, wait, what room? I said, wait, what patient? And, and I said, no, I, I've, I've talked to that patient multiple times, I, and I introduced myself as Dr. Blackstock. And I just realized, you know, so, sometimes it doesn't matter if, if the doctor doesn't, if, if you don't look like the doctor in someone's head, then you're never going to be the doctor. You know? So, I mean, those are the kind of things where it's like you're having a good day, and that happens, and you're like, ugh. You know, just, and you're having a bad day and that happens and just like, it just, you're like, I need, I need to take a break. But, um, you know, I also write about in the book, you know, just my experience in academic medicine, um, which I think, you know, is very familiar for, I think, you know, black folks and folks of color in just organizations in general. Um, but when I started at NYU, I was one of two black faculty in my department. And I know for a lot of if black professors in the audience, that's not unusual. But you know, it's in the middle of the most diverse, one of the most diverse cities in the world. And I think one thing that always struck me was that my, my colleagues never thought about it. 
I was the only one. Even I remember once one of my residents said, oh, I hadn't noticed, a white woman, I hadn't noticed that you were the only black faculty in our department. You know, um, and, but I felt like, okay, I'm here, I'm gonna make a difference, I'm gonna help to mentor our students. Like that's, I think for a lot of us, being there, being representation, it means so, so much to us because we know, especially in academic medicine, mentorship can determine your career and how successful it is. Um, and so I was doing all the things I thought I was supposed to do. I was checking off all the boxes. I had started an emergency ultrasound curriculum for the medical school. I had founded our department's first emergency ultrasound fellowship. And um, I went up for promotion and it was denied. And I always say it was like a slap in the face, but it was like the slap in the face that I needed. I say that because a lot of times you don't realize, and especially I think in medicine, we're on this journey where we do check off a lot of boxes. On to the next, we take our boards, we do residency, we do fellowship, we get a position, we, we do all the things that we're supposed to do, we think to get promoted. And I think in that moment, I recognized that a lot of the work that I had done that I thought was important was not necessarily important to my institution. And I think a lot of that work that we do is the unseen work, like the unseen work of mentoring our students who come to us for everything. Um, and there's really no way to quantify that. I mentioned that you started writing this book um, after the murder of George Floyd, after what you experienced as a, as a physician during COVID, the people that you were caring for each and every day while many Americans had the luxury of staying home. So when you think about medical school and the curricula that these schools have today, do you think there's, there's change happening or is it still, you know, just... Yeah, I would, not enough. Not enough. No, not enough. It's, it, I mean, it's happening at a glacial pace. I think that, um, you know, even thinking about, for example, you know, I write about kidney function in the book, how there are these two set of normal values for kidney function, one for black people and one for non-black people. And literally, there are still hospitals in, that have those different values um, that are still teaching students about that based on the, a myth from slavery that black people have more muscle mass. And so, but what, what that myth has done, though, is it actually has deferred placement of black people on kidney transplant lists because it's given inaccurate values for their kidney function. It's also deferred them from being um, referred to kidney, specialty ki kidney care. And so right now, a lot of National Kidney Foundation is actually going back to find people who had been, not been placed on the kidney transplant years ago because their kidney function was seen as normal. But again, like this is still being taught in medical schools. You cite a study from 2016 that uh, was really shocking for me to read that a certain percentage of medical school students at the time believe that black people have a higher pain threshold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so talk about how that then <laughs> correlates with right. misdiagnoses or turning people away when they are in pain and not getting the right, right medicine. And so I just want people to understand, like, there's, there are all these levels at which black people are experiencing harm. So it's like systemically in our communities, and then when we interface with the healthcare system, and, you know, whether we have access or don't have access to care, then once we have access, we have to deal with this fact that there are health professionals taking care of us who actually think that there's something biologically different about us in terms of how we feel pain. So the study I that you were referring to is from 2016 at the University of Virginia. It was a study of medical students and residents and they were given two mock cases and the only difference in the cases were the race of the patients. Um, and the students were asked to rate the patient's pain as well as to recommend a dose of pain medication. And for the most part, the students gave the black patient um, a lower score of pain for their pain and lower amount of pain medication. Those authors also came up with these myths. Um, black patients' skin are thicker. They're, 
their skin is less sensitive. And so they asked the students and the residents if they believed in those, those myths. And half of them said they did, that they were probably true. And they found that those students and trainees that believed in them actually were the ones that were more likely to rate the patients, the black patients pain lower and to give less pain medication. And so I talk about that study because everyone's like, no, but we're in, you know, we're in you know, 20, now we're in 2024. And the fact is, is that people who become health professionals, people who become physicians, they are living and in society just like anybody else. They are absorbing all this cultural, cultural messaging that is very largely anti-black, and that is influencing how they care for our patients. Like, I actually am doing um, some work with um, an over-the-counter pain medication, um, I'm consulting with them, but we, had, we did a round table with patients, and the stories that our patients tell about when their pain was ignored and what that, what that did. So it wasn't just the fact that people are in physical pain, but that can cause also emotional consequences like depression and anxiety. But it's usually because of a misdiagnosis, like you're missing something. So you're either missing a heart attack, you're missing an ectopic pregnancy, you're missing um, a metastatic cancer. Like th people almost died in the, you know, the patients that we were talking to. And so that's why you know, not treating someone's pain can have very, very serious consequences. In a few minutes, we're going to take some of your questions. There are microphones set up on either side of the theater. But I wanted to get into um, the idea of the, the doctor-patient dynamic, because we've all heard that phrase, doctor knows best. Right. I'm sure many of us have been in the situation where we're in the doctor's office and we don't feel listened to. I know. So what recourse do people have when they feel like, you know, there's just something off? And this happened to you even, where yes. you could have died I know. because of a misdiagnosis mm -hmm. based on, maybe you can tell the story, go ahead. Yeah, no, when I was a first year medical student, um, I had sudden abdominal pain in the middle of lecture. I ended up going to the hospital and um, it took three ER visits over the course of a week to correctly diagnose me with appendicitis. By that time, um, it had ruptured, and I needed um, an open active appendectomy, not a laparoscopic, you know, like with the camera. And I developed complications that led me to miss a month of school. But when I reflected back on those interactions with the medical team, I was questioned repeatedly about my sexual activity and not believed. I was um, told I didn't seem to be in that much pain. Um, and so looking back, I'm like, would that have happened? You know, and if I wasn't a young black woman, I don't know. That is like the, you know, the distraction of racism that Toni Morrison, you know, talks about. Um, yeah, I almost, I, almost, I almost lost my life because of that. And as a medical student, I felt too scared to speak up. I was actually in one of the visits with my twin sister who was in school with me and she whispered to me, I think, we, I think you have appendicitis. <laughs> but we were too scared to speak up. So you can imagine what you know, the average person who has no medical training at all. So sometimes I feel like, you know, it's unfair for us to ask patients to advocate for themselves, to feel like you're going to war when you are seeking care. That the issue is with the system, right? So I wanna put the onus is on the, on the institutions and the system that especially for our communities have proven themselves untrustworthy for, for a very long time. Um, but I also do say, so there was like, there is a, this viral video on TikTok within the last few weeks. I don't know if anyone saw it. It was of a, a young white health professional who said, I wanna know why when I go into a room with my black patients, they always have someone on FaceTime. And I'm like, of course, because they don't trust you. It's like bringing someone else with you to a visit. So I always say people should bring a loved one, a trusted friend with them to the visit. For, it could be for surveillance purposes, to make sure that you're, you know, that you're being treated well, but also sometimes when you're not feeling well, you may not be able to speak up for yourself. So that's the other thing. The other thing I tell people is write down what symptoms you're having, um, the duration, also ask your health professional, what do you think is going on with me? 
What is your plan for me? What is the follow-up? What are the red flags that I should return back to the hospital for or call 911 for? Like, make sure that you have clear answers. And then obviously, if you feel like you're not being listened to, obviously in the ER situation it's different because you may not have other professionals there to take care of you, but I do think you can ask for a second and third opinion. I do wanna say that, you know, of course, black women are finding the solutions. There are, um, like, there's Health in Her Hue, which is a directory of, of health professionals of all different racial demographic backgrounds that have re received training, um, um, evaluations for, for caring for black women and women of color. There's another app, there's an app called the Earth App, I-R-T-H, that is a directory of maternal health professionals as well. So I think it's more kind of like the formal, informal way of asking your friends, like who do you, talk, who do you see, who should I see, which happens actually a lot in our communities. Um, but you always wanna ask for recommendations from people that you know. I know some of you have questions for the amazing Dr. Blackstock, so please uh, line up under behind those microphones. And, and while we wait for some of our audience members to do so, you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, when we think about advocacy yes. and bringing attention to health disparities yes. and the work that's being done, it shouldn't just be on the shoulders of black and brown people in this country. And so you have a call to action for people right. in this audience as well mm -hmm. as for readers of your book. Yes. Can you share? Yes, so at the end of the book, I have a chapter that's dedicated to people who are like, well, what do I do now? Um, and so, you know, I know the problem sometimes can seem so overwhelming. Obviously, for medical schools and health profession schools, we know, you know, we have an idea of what they need to do in terms of how, how are they educating and training our future health professionals. But also, I think that um, faculty and staff need continuing education development too. A lot of these issues that we're talking about today, many of them weren't trained in, or many of them don't know about. Um, I think in terms of hospitals and health systems, we really need to have standardized processes in place that are keeping track of health equity metrics. We need to bring community members in. Like I think every hospital or health system should have community members on the board. Really thinking about like what is important to the community, what are the metrics that we should be using, really, um, you know, doing focus groups, having accountability is very important. Um, I think for our policymakers, uh, and this is like local, local, state, and beyond, we need to think about what is health in all policies. So I talked about how only 20% of someone's health is determined by their access to health care. The other 80% is determined by like where, where they live, right? So the amount of green space, whether they live in a food desert or not. Um, what kind of, how safe are they at work? Like we saw in the pandemic, so many low wage workers had to go to work without family, families or paid sick leave, without health insurance, and they were exposed to the public, right? So I want us to think about what does health look like in all other policies? And then if all of that seems so overwhelming, we, and I shared with you for people to look about, look around what's happening, not necessarily in your neighborhood, but your surrounding communities that don't look like yours. There are some really wonderful efforts taking place. Like I know um, the, the, the doula who's right, what's your name? Sayana. Sayana? Uh -huh. Yes, I, I would love for her to talk a little bit about her work, but in the book I talk about um, a black midwife in Minneapolis, that Minneapolis has some of the worst health, health inequities. Um, and she founded the Roots Birthing Center with the mission of providing dignified and respectful care to black birthing people. And they have seen improved preterm delivery rates and maternal complications just by that model. And so these are the kind of organizations you wanna invest in, you wanna amplify their work, you wanna find out how you can help, right? So even if it's, if it's not on a larger level, it could be on a hyper-local and local level. So we're gonna take some questions from the audience. We'll start with uh, this side first, go ahead. If you get to say your name. Sure, happy to. Good evening, everybody. My name is Addie Ceballos. Hi, Dr. Blackstock. Hi, Hi, I love you, I, I love adore you. you. I love You're you brilliant, <laughs> you are brilliant. So a question that a lot of us might have right now is in the midst of this incredibly important but difficult work, 
and in the midst of a political climate, a global climate that feels just daunting right now, how are you able to push through and manage your own mental, emotional, spiritual, physical health while doing this work? Thank you, thank you, Addie. And I know she's asked me because she's also looking out for me. Thank you. <laughs> um, but I I'll say I, I do it with intentionality. I'm not always, I'm not always good at it. One, one thing I will say is that this is like my contribution to addressing these issues. Like, if I wasn't doing this, I'd be like, ah, like just you know, sc screaming outside into the void. So doing this work is also therapeutic for me, but I also get to draw my own boundaries about who I work with, who I don't work with. As you know, so I also have my own um, consulting from Advancing Health Equity. We work with healthcare organizations around these issues, around bias and racism in healthcare. And so they are organizations, for the most part, that want to do the good work. Some of them want to check boxes, but you know we want to make sure that they're they're doing this important work. You know, I make time to to meditate. I make time for my long walks and my podcasts. I make time to talk to my my therapist, who is a black queer woman who has a very different worldview than I do, but gives me permission to think outside of the box. Um, because for, for so long, you know, I did not think outside of the box. I was just checking boxes. Um, so I feel like now I'm living more in alignment. So part of this, the book also, is my own personal journey to recognizing that sometimes we have to step outside of environments that we thought were for us, but actually were not really made for us. And sometimes we have to do the work from the outside. Thank you. Did you want to ask your question? Oh, yes. You could you share your name, please. Vanessa Lyles. Oh, no. Vanessa Lyles. Uh, they, they want me to say Dr. Vanessa Lyles, but I'm a PhD, not an MD. That's okay. Yes. Bless. <laughs> Own it, <laughs> Dr. Lyles. <laughs> thank you. But um, so thank you so much, Dr. Blackstone, for sharing your personal story. I got so much more out of this than I anticipated tonight, and the bar was high already. Um, but I haven't read the book yet, but I will. But I'm wondering, the work that I do with my colleagues in, at PT Partners in Bridgeport is work around organizing um, in public housing against a lot of systems of, uh, uh, you know, that um, form to oppress in a very compounded way for that, for, for, the, for the majority women who live there in public housing. And um, a lot of what you said, I really appreciate you talking about things from a systemic level, because I think that's much more instructional and much and gets to the heart of where the problems are. And I just, I, since I haven't read your book, have you thought about how the different systems or institutions compound the health issue? Mm -hmm. So systemically, yes, there's a lot um, that happens with healthcare, but how does that impact being, if you're low socioeconomic status and things like yeah, that? Yeah, no, I mean, I don't have t enough time in the book to get very into it, but I strongly feel it's all interconnected. So one, one study that I do cite in the book is a study that was done um, looking at interactions between, um, in Minneapolis, between community members and the, poli and, and the police, so basically mostly police brutality, and showing that that actually influenced levels of mistrust towards healthcare institutions, and so that people were actually less likely to have, even if they witnessed um, interaction with the police, they were less likely to seek care when they needed it. And so what that results in is a very high burden of unmet needs in our communities. So that's the other thing, like, as, as a physician, like that's a study I need to know about. As a health professional, that's a study that I need to know about if I wanna be able to be effective in my role. So, so this idea, I, um, I didn't talk about it today as much, but there's this idea of, like, of structural competence, of, of, of you know, understanding how you know, structures and structural violence you know, impact the social determinants of health more downstream and then um, the health outcomes that we see. But that is what, I would love more for our health professionals and people outside to, to understand that health is not just about access to health care, it's about housing, you know, it's about employment, it's about all of the other social determinants of health as well. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Say your name, please. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm Mindy Pritchard. Hi, Dr. Blackstock. Thanks so much for coming. Um, I have a 24-year-old daughter who is white, and she is in her first year of medical school. And I was wondering if you have suggestions for what 
she can do as the recipient of whatever their curriculum is to best impact what education she gets and then what she can do as she goes on to become a physician to be a more equitable doctor. I actually want to throw this out. To, is there anyone in the audience who feels they have the energy or the reserve to answer this? <laughs> Was it that big a question? <laughs> it's a tough one. You can ask her to do the research herself. Um, in what regard? To look up these studies on her own um, rather than asking black people to speak up on their experiences. Ah, okay. So, so, the, so the one thing I did, and this is what I wrote in my book, that so a lot of times, so when, when I was in academic medicine, I saw so many of our faculty leave, black faculty leave, and my colleagues did not even notice, right? I saw our students when, um, for example, Eric Garner in Staten Island, when he was killed by the police, I saw them protesting, organizing protests, and their, and their, white, their white peers not doing anything. Hmm. We need you to think outside of yourselves. Right. So look at what's happening, you know, what are the, what's going on with the, what's even going on in terms of the diversity of the school? Mm -hmm. Is it an inclusive place for her classmates? Mm -hmm. what, are, what are they learning or not learning the curriculum? There's a lot that's on the AAMC website, the American Association of Medical Colleges, of, curric of curriculums in health equity, um, addressing racial health inequities that she can that she can look up. There's a lot. There, there's so there's so much that she can do her part in. It may seem overwhelming, but she can choose one or two things and say, "This is going to be my mission to work on before I graduate from school." Mm -hmm. So you'd recommend that she sort of does it independently, as opposed to trying to swim. I, no, I mean, she can do it independently, or she can organize with other right. other white students. Right. I would love to see that. Right. I, I would I would love to see that because one thing I talk about is this idea that a lot of these issues, like we feel so overburdened with and we are not the ones that created them. No, yeah, okay, thank you. Good evening, <laughs> thank you guys, uh, this was amazing. Um, I was telling my wife if we should have brought our son because he would have been ecstatic about your discussion about the systemic issues. Um, I was talking to Ms. Nalpinancho earlier that my wife is a pediatric nephrologist and she's mentioned that I guess your mom was a, nep a nephrologist so there's a connection there. She's probably gonna chase you down and get the book signed. <laughs> any, in any event, my name is Earl Bloodworth and um, you talked a lot about policy violence and, I, and um, one of the things I'm a firm believer of is that a lot of the issues that we see inherent in the black community or people of color community is that um, like stuff like poverty and the health inequities it's a policy choice, um, most definitely. And then you have, you know, the higher morbidities with different issues of, you know, diabetes and, and heart disease. I work in the field of reentry with individuals coming out of prison, and their issues are exacerbated, and they are even more likely to have um, higher morbidity and mortality rates coming out of prison. So I'm wondering, one, how do we deal with that as a policy issue? And then two, again, you talked about that earlier study that closed down a lot of the black um, HBCUs medical schools. Um, in business, they call that, uh, I wanna say it's opportunity cost or cost of opportunity. Right. And I'm wondering how you think that impacts from there till now. That opportunity cost and the issues of racism that we deal with on a daily basis that stress us out um, you know, and impact us even epigenetically, you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I, obviously, I think, uh, obviously, you know, mass incarceration has targeted our community, um, si especially since the 80s, and the fact that um, when that incarcerated individuals' health worsens, when they're incarcerated, it, it just, I mean, it, 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 it makes sense, right? And, it, and even though there are um, health professionals Supposedly there to take care of them. It, it's not. It's not happening. So no. So no. I yes. There's 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 policy violence happening all around us in every single social institution. I think that you know obviously health professionals need to be aware of what's happening in term in the, in the I call it the criminal the criminal legal system um, because we are not like we need to be our patients' advocates. 
we, we, we need to be our patients' advocates truly in, in, in more ways than one. It's not really not just about direct care, but in terms of advocacy for them. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, don't, I don't even know. <laughs> that's, I mean, I'm not surprised that that's the case, that worsening outcomes after being incarcerated, but we know what else worsens, right? Mental health and also physical health and so much more. Um, right, right, and that's, well, then, then that's a whole other conversation with the fact that we have a, you know, a, a, a fragmented healthcare system um, that's largely for profit that unfortunately um, doesn't focus on preventive care um, there's more focus on what happens in terms of, treat, of treating disease and illness, but in terms of like an investment in the public health workforce, we don't have that. Um, and then another question about the Flexner report. Yes, I think I think you know what we're seeing today the repercussions of that report. Just like we're still gonna, we're probably going to see the repercussions of the SCOTUS decision on race conscious admissions from last fall. We're going to also see that for generations to come, unless unless we you know, organize, work with legal advocates and, and come up with a, a other ways to, to address it. Um, but I also want to talk about like, just my, my own experience, I talk about in the book, about you know, growing up in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, and wondering why my neighborhood never had, we didn't have a supermarket, why um, we had to drive to the closest park, Prospect Park, why um, my parents didn't feel comfortable sending us to schools in the neighborhood because they were like, I'm not sure you're gonna get a quality education there. But I also remember deeply loving my neighbors and feeling very much like, you know, we were a community. If it, there was an alternate side of the street parking as there is in New York City, you have to move your car. We, you, people would always let us know. They would ring our doorbell. So we were a community and I think Growing up, I was like, I just not understanding why even a few minutes away in Park Slope, they had all of these amenities, the neighborhood was clean. And I realized um, as I got older that I had grown up in the, the part of Crown Heights I grew up in was a formerly red line neighborhood. Um, and so what I had been seeing was decades of chronic disinvestment in my neighborhood. Um, and we know today that, that those formerly red line neighborhoods map onto neighborhoods with a very worst health outcomes. So nothing is by accident. Everything is by design. Um, you know, education is part of it. Action and policy are the other part of it. I think we only have time for one more question. So um, who wants to, to get that final question in? <laughs> thank you. Appreciate that. So uh, thank you to our moderator. And, and thank you, uh, Dr. Blackstone, for coming and talking to us about these issues. Um, and a shout out to my frat brother for bringing the books here. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you. So I am a board of directors member of a health corporation in the Northeast. What do you want me to take back to my board members uh, when I travel to my board meeting on Thursday? And second, uh, would you do a Zoom with us at some point? <laughs> okay, the second question, you could, you could talk to my agent. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, the first question, we can tell me what, what does your organization do? Like, what so, is, what so is the I'm, mission of it? I'm on the board of directors of Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Rhode Island. Oh, okay. And, 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 and what I know of Blue Cross Blue Shield in terms of the work I've done with them previously, they are, have a, they ha, I know they have a health equity or, or equity division, or they're doing some of this work, but I think what it's really important is for the folks that are on the board, on the board, to really understand, like even the, the, what we talked about today, the, this Health Equity 101, they need to understand that because many don't even understand that. I actually met with a group of, of healthcare executives in Massachusetts a few weeks ago and I did a keynote for them, literally just laying out the history. Not just redlining the GI Bill, um, also, what else? With, oh, other aspects of the New Deal, just in terms of how historical policies impact how our communities look and feel today, right? And what can be done at a community level, what can be done at a local level, a state level, to how do we, re how do, not even reinvest, because there's no re, how do we invest in our communities? How do we actually give resources to community, the, the, the groups that are embedded in the community, like yours, right? Like your, can you, can you just talk a little bit about the work that you're doing? Because I, I would say even this, I, I, I just want to give you, because I know you've been doing, you're a doula for 20 years in, in Connecticut.
but, but this, this is the kind of effort that you're always supporting. Good evening, everybody. I'm Sayana Devotion from Earth's Natural Touch for Care and Beyond. We are the largest black-owned doula training organization and collective in New England. We have doulas across several states, um, and we've been training here in New England since 2016. Um, part of our mission is to eliminate racial disparities in birth outcomes. Thank you. But so in addition to measure, you know, the metrics, keeping track of the metrics, what do you do with the metrics, right? What's, what is Blue Cross Blue Shield doing in terms of, you know, their, uh, what do you call them? Is it customers? I'm sorry. What do you, what do you call yeah, them? Yeah, we call, we call them clients. But we, clients. Have, we, we put out a health disparities um, annual in conjunction with Brown Medical School. Right, but, 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 looking, but looking at the metrics, right, but then saying, okay, so what are we going to do about, because we already know we have the data, we have enough data, right, what are going to be the interventions on a community level, we know a lot of the resources are, are already there, how can we support groups like these, right? Okay, enough. <laughs> Thank you. We started... We started this conversation talking about your mother, and I know that she is with you every day. What do you think she would say to you if she was able to see this journey that you have taken? Oh, I should say, baby girl, I'm so proud of you. And, and I did want to share, it's, it's in the book, but I had a conversation with my mom when she was, when she was sick, and I was um, in my, you know, a sophomore in school. It's one of those conversations, like, you don't ever want to have, but I asked her, I said, what is something that I should know before you go? Mm -hmm. And she said, I want you to take care of yourself. And as a 19-year-old, I did not get it. I was like, okay, I guess. But now, as a 46-year-old, as a parent, as a founder, as an author, you know, now I know what she meant. And I almost grieve a little bit that I didn't recognize my mother in all her fullness at the time, that she was just my mom. But obviously she's so much more and I get to tell people about her in this book. Thank you so much. 